We're delighted that so many of you are here today, and we hope very much that you will find this an, an interesting and instructive and fun uh, session connected with the exhibition that we have just opened, Byzantium and Islam, Age of Transition. It's on view upstairs on the second floor in the Cantor Gallery, and we hope very much that you will all go to it uh, during the course of its run through July 8th. Today, we're going to have three distinguished speakers um, who in varying ways have been very involved in the exhibition or in events connected to the exhibition, and then a performance by Alan Gampel, who is researching origins of musical notation that reach back into this period, and who is also a very distinguished classical pianist. I am going to try to keep everything more or less on time so we can get all the interesting material in by minimizing the length of my introductions. Um, you've come, so you must know these people that are going to speak are extremely interesting. And the first of our speakers today is Father Justin of the Monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai in Egypt. Father Justin and I met when he came in 1997 to the end of the Glory of Byzantium, my first exhibition. And we have um, grown to know, know each other over the years in which he has served at the Holy Monastery, in particular in charge of their library, one of the greatest repositories of manuscripts related to the Orthodox world, and in a special context of trying to arrange for a very sophisticated digital images of all the works. In his role at the monastery, he is very involved with the icons, and we, although they were unable to come to the exhibition because of the situation in Egypt, we look forward to his remarks today on the icons at Sinai. Would you join me in welcoming Father Justin? It's a great joy to be here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and to be a part of these presentations. I'll be speaking on the theme, The Icons of Sinai, Continuity at a Time of Controversy. The eighth and ninth centuries witnessed an intense debate over the very principles of Christian imagery. This was the iconoclast controversy, which lasted over 100 years from the beginning in the year 726 to its final resolution in 843. But the issues that were then in conflict were not new. We will better understand them if we begin by looking briefly at the earliest surviving examples of Christian art. These are to be found in the Roman catacombs, vast underground cemeteries that surround the city of Rome. Epitaphs and tomb paintings from the catacombs date principally from the second to the fourth centuries. The first example, now in the Lateran Museum, is dated to the fourth century, and is thought to have come from the catacomb of St. Callistus or Pritistatus. It reads, Aurelius Castus, who lived eight months. Antonia Sperantia made this for her son. Below is a depiction of a shepherd he bears a lamb on his shoulders, and two sheep recline at his feet. These early Christians express their faith instinctively in both text and images. But inscriptions are accessible in a way that imagery is not. Depictions such as this are for the initiate and require explanation. Jesus told a parable about a shepherd who sought out the sheep that had gone astray. Bearing it on his shoulders, he returned it to its place in the fold. He also said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Galatian Sacramentary, which preserves some of the oldest Latin liturgical prayers, includes a prayer for the burial service that refers to the dead as carried home on the shoulders of the good shepherd. Other recurring Christian symbols are the anchor or the dove bearing an olive branch in its beak. On later epitaphs, we find more overt Christian symbols, the Cairo monogram or the Alpha and Omega. 
The Catacomb of Comadilla contains an image of Christ dating from the late fourth century. In the Catacomb of St. Priscilla, one finds a depiction of the Virgin Mary dated to the second century. Here also, in the third century, Christians painted the Good Shepherd and doves bearing olive branches. They also painted the three children in the fiery furnace of Babylon, examples of courage and perseverance and reminders of God's protection at a time of persecution. The epitaphs of these early Christians reveal much about their faith. We read, to dear Kyriakos, sweetest son, mayest thou live in the Holy Spirit. Regina, mayest thou live in the Lord Jesus. Matrona, Matrona, who lived a year and 52 days, pray for thy parents. Anatolius made this for his well-deserving son, who lived seven years, seven months, and 20 days. May thy spirit rest well in God. Pray for thy sister. The catacombs inscriptions are ill-composed, ill-written, not infrequently ill-spelt. Half Latin, half Greek, but neither bad grammar nor defective orthography condemn or distort the light with which the consciousness of an immortality floods and glorifies these subterranean vaults. Such inscriptions are popular expressions of the same hope that we find in a theological treatise, De Mortalitate, written by Cyprian of Carthage in the year 252. He reminds his flock that death is not an ending, but a transit, and this journey being traversed, a passage to eternity. The dead are not lost, but sent before. He writes, we regard paradise as our country, we already began to consider the patriarchs as our parents. Why do we not hasten and run, that we may behold our country, that we may greet our parents? There, a great number of our dear ones is awaiting us, and a dense crowd of parents, brothers, children is longing for us, already assured of their own safety, and still solicitous for our salvation. In this spontaneous expression of their faith through words and images, had Christians gone too far? The Roman world was filled with paintings and statues of the pagan deities. The Jews had always been careful to distance themselves from this idolatry. There were those who felt that such Christian depictions were an unguarded appropriation from the pagan world. Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century church history relates that the woman with an issue of blood who was healed by Christ made a bronze statue to commemorate this miracle. Christ was depicted standing and blessing her, and she was portrayed kneeling and looking up to him in gratitude. Eusebius writes that he has seen this statue for himself, yet we cannot miss the note of criticism in his voice when he goes on to write, nor is it strange that those of the Gentiles who of all were benefited by our Savior should have done such things, since we have learned also that the likenesses of the apostles Paul and Peter and of Christ himself are preserved in paintings, the ancients being accustomed, as it is likely, according to a habit of the Gentiles, to pay this kind of honor indiscriminately to those regarded by them as deliverers. One would want to know what these fourth century paintings of Christ and the apostles Paul and Peter look like. But paintings are fragile, and in general, they have not survived from the world of late antiquity. The exception to this is Sinai. This remote desert monastery with its dry and stable climate and an unbroken history extending back to the early fourth century holds what is today the most important collection of panel icons, 36 of which have been dated to the sixth or seventh century. The icon of the Sinai Christ is the most famous. It was painted in the wax encaustic technique, which uses wax as the medium for the pigments. The gold helio is set off by alternating four and eight petal punched rosettes. Christ's mantle and tunic were rendered in a saturated purple. 
He blesses with his right hand, and his left he holds the gospel, a thick volume closed with two clasps. The cover is adorned with a cross executed in precious stones and decorated with pearls. The formal frontal depiction of Christ conveys a sense of timelessness, yet the many intentional departures from strict symmetry add a naturalistic effect. In this subtle manner, the artist has attempted to convey both the divine and human natures in Christ. A second icon depicts the Virgin Mary and the Christ child enthroned. Here also Christ blesses with his right hand, while with his left he holds a scroll. The Virgin wears red shoes, an imperial prerogative, and holds Christ tenderly. She gazes off into the distance. A soldier saint stands to either side wearing the ceremonial robe of the imperial guard. These are identified by later iconographic types as St. George to the viewer's right and St. Theodore to the viewer's left. Above, two archangels holding scepters look up towards heaven. The hand of God extends from an orb and a ray of light descends to the halo of the Holy Virgin. The two archangels, rendered in a continuation of the Hellenistic tradition, contrast with the enthroned Virgin and Christ child and two soldier saints, which reflect the splendors of the imperial court, giving the icon a complexity and richness. The third icon shows the apostle Peter. In his right hand, he holds three keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In his left, he holds a staff surmounted by a cross. The artist has painted the garments of the apostle in shades of olive using crisscrossing highlights rendered in bold brushstrokes. The gaze of the viewer is drawn to the calm and pensive eyes, the face set off by whirling turfs of hair and beard. The apostle has the face of the sunburned fisherman, but he also has the aristocratic demeanor of the leader of the church. The three medallions above depict Christ in the center. Kurt Weitzman identified the other two as depictions of the Virgin Mary and St. John the Theologian, though it has been recently suggested that they may be instead ex photo images included as an expression of thanksgiving by those who commissioned the icon. All three icons are thought to have been painted in Constantinople and may have been sent to the monastery in the sixth century as gifts of imperial patronage when the Emperor Justinian ordered the construction of the great basilica and the surrounding fortress walls. As such, they are examples of the icons that would have been in Constantinople at the outbreak of iconoclasm, which the Emperor Leo III, the Asarian, began to institute in the year 726. There were two phases of iconoclasm. The first came to an end under the Empress Irene in 787. An iconoclast policy was instituted again in 815 by the Emperor Leo V, the Armenian. The second phase was brought to an end in 843 by the Empress Theodora. The origins of iconoclasm have been much debated. The seventh century was a very much an age of transition for the Byzantine Empire. It was a culmination of a long process of centralization by which Constantinople emerged as the dominant center of power. In the same century, the empire lost Syria, Egypt, and North Africa to the Arab world, while Slavs threatened its hold in the Balkans and Lombards became more assertive in Italy. The Arab forces attacked Constantinople itself in 674 to 678, and again in 717 to 718, the Greeks famously defending their city with Greek fire. All of these far-reaching changes and conflicts caused a reassessment of the Byzantine polity. This brought into the open issues concerning the place of Christian imagery that have remained unresolved. One must look to these conflicts for the origins of iconoclasm more than to any infiltration of the church and the empire by alien ideas. God commanded Moses 
Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. The central charge brought by the iconoclasts again and again is that of idolatry. Any image that has been created for use in worship draws attention to the visible material creature rather than the invisible deity. St. Paul, in his epistle to the Colossians, refers to Christ as the image, the icon of the invisible God. In the language of the creed, Christ is one in essence, homoousios, consubstantial with the Father. For the iconoclasts, in order for an image to be true, it must be the same in essence as that which it represents. There must be a formal identity between a model and its archetype. A betrayal differs in its very nature from that which it represents and is therefore insufficient if not deceptive. Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Created images could not be allowed to intrude and in worship, which must remain entirely spiritual. In a number of churches, iconoclasts removed icons of Christ and replaced them with a depiction of the cross. The cross, being a symbol, did not detract from the worship that is due to God alone. Saint Stephen the New was insistent in his veneration of the holy icons. He was brought before the emperor Constantine V, who asked him, do you imagine that Christ is trampled upon when we trample upon these images? St. Stephen had expected this and had brought with him a coin. He showed it to the emperor and asked, whose is this image and superscription? It is mine, answered the emperor. The saint placed it on the ground and trampled on it. The emperor's guards were outraged and ready to avenge this affront to the imperial dignity. But the emperor called them off. The saint had made his point. And yet, while everyone knew that there had been icons in the church for centuries, in many ways they had been taken for granted. There were passing references to them in the writings of the fathers, but there was no formal theology of the icons. What could be said in their defense? Those who reverenced the icons pointed out that God had indeed forbidden the making of graven images, but at the same time he had commanded Moses, and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. The second commandment was thus not a prohibition against representational art, but it was a prohibition against attempting to betray the deity. For God had revealed himself but not in any form. Moses said to the children of Israel, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. But in the fullness of time, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God who was uncircumscribable condescended to be circumscribed by time and place. And he who was indepictable became depictable. St. Theodore the Studite wrote that in Christ, the divine nature and the human nature were united into a single prosopon, person, and a single hypostasis, a subsistent entity, which has individual characteristics and can be portrayed. And St. John of Damascus wrote, I do not venerate the creation instead of the creator, but I venerate the creator created for my sake who came down to his creation without being lowered or weakened that he might glorify my nature and bring about communion with the divine nature. I do not depict the invisible divinity, but I depict God made visible in the flesh. Icons are a witness to the historical Christ. A refusal to accept icons was a refusal to accept the full implications of the incarnation. Courts of Roman law had an image of the emperor and this image was honored as if the emperor himself were present. Basil the Great in the fourth century pointed out that this does not mean that there are two emperors because the honor offered to the image crosses over to the archetype. 
An image conveys the likeness of the original person. Image and archetype are thus said to share the same likeness. St. Dionysius is the Arabogite in his ecclesiastical hierarchy had written, for the truth is shown in the likeness, the archetype and the icon, each and the other with the difference of essence. This was quoted by Patriarch Nikephoros of Constantinople in the early ninth century, who himself wrote, likeness is an intermediate relation and mediates between the extremes. I mean the likeness and the one of whom it is a likeness, uniting and connecting by form, even though they differ by nature. And yet a traditional icon was not a simple portrait. The likenesses conveyed in the icons were those of Christ or the saints who live in heaven. Here, St. John appealed to the example of the tabernacle that had been constructed for the worship of God in the Sinai wilderness. God said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I shew thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. The tabernacle on earth shared the likeness with the tabernacle in heaven that had been revealed to Moses. Because of this correspondence, the ministry of the priests within the tabernacle was unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as we read in the epistle to the Hebrews. St. John of Damascus writes, and this whole tabernacle was an icon and look, said the Lord to Moses, that thou make everything after their pattern, which was shewed thee in the mount. The tabernacle is called an icon in that it is a reflection of the heavenly prototype. Icons of Christ and the saints are also reflections, each corresponding to an archetype in heaven. As St. Theodore the Studite wrote, the copy shares the glory of the prototype as a reflection shares the brightness of the light. Christ said to his disciples, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. St. John of Damascus invoked this verse as he stressed the parallels between hearing the holy scriptures and seeing the holy icons. Our hearing is sanctified and blessed when we hear Christ's words in the holy gospels even as we also rejoice and are assured, beholding in the holy icons his bodily form, his miracles, and all that he endured. Both scriptures and icons are distinct but complementary means of knowing the gospel narrative. Where iconoclasts had created a dualism, depreciating the material world and their reverence for the spiritual, those who venerated the icons pointed to a material world sanctified by the incarnation and the means of our ascent to the spiritual. We read in St. John of Damascus, for instance, we are twofold, fashion of soul and body, and our soul is not naked, but as it were covered by a mantle. It is impossible for us to reach what is intelligible apart from what is bodily. And St. Theodore wrote, so whether in an image or in the gospel or in the cross or in any other consecrated object, there God is manifestly worshiped in spirit and in truth as the materials are exalted by the raising of the mind towards God. The mind does not remain with the materials because it does not trust in them. That is the error of the idolaters. Through the materials, rather, the mind ascends towards the prototype this is the faith of the Orthodox. The theology of icons championed by John of Damascus, Theodore the Studite, and a multitude of other saints was formally proclaimed by the bishops who assembled in 787 at the Second Council of Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Sinai became a part of the world of Islam in the year 633. Even so, both monks and pilgrims continue to come to this remote wilderness, attracted by its austerity, its biblical associations, and its reputation as an established center of monasticism. The area was thus outside the Byzantine Empire in the 8th and 9th centuries, 
and remained unaffected by iconoclasm. Fourteen panel icons of Sinai have been dated to this time. They are of special importance in that they show the continuity of the iconoclastic tradition during the period of iconoclasm. An icon of the crucifixion has been dated to the 8th century because of many similarities with the fresco of Santa Maria Antiqua in Rome that can be dated to 741 to 752. Grace is depicted affixed to the cross, wearing a red-brown colobium. Streams of blood and water issue from his side. To his right stands the Virgin Mary. She points to Christ with her right hand and with her left holds a handkerchief to her cheek. Above are the monograms for Iagia Maria, the Holy Mary. To Christ's left is a youthful John the theologian. His depiction is described simply Ioannis, John. Above, angels look on in wonder, while the sun and the moon are darkened. Below, three soldiers divide Christ's garments. This is the earliest icon giving the names of the two thieves, Gustus to Christ's right and Demas to his left. Earlier icons invariably portray Christ with his eyes opened before his death. An important example is the Fieschi Morgan Stavrothiki, which also dates from the 8th century, kept here in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Sinai icon is the first to depict Christ with his eyes closed and bearing the crown of thorns. This was done to emphasize his human nature. Anastasius of Sinai in the Odigos, the guidebook written in the 680s, notes the importance of depicting the reality of Christ's death. This and several stylistic details make it possible that this icon was painted at Sinai. An icon dated to the 8th or 9th century depicts Saint Irene. The inscription above gives her name, Iagia Irini, Saint Irene. She stands in a frontal pose. In her right hand, she holds a cross, emblem of her martyrdom, while in her left, she holds a handkerchief. She is dressed in a huton, originally of blue, which has turned green, a mephorion of carmen and red shoes. The figure of the saint is disproportionate, the emphasis given to her face. At the base of the icon, the donor has been depicted venerating the saint. He wears a light brown tunic and a black mantle. An inscription above gives his name, Nikolaos Savatianos. The icon shares the likeness of its prototype in heaven, as we have learned from the passages quoted above. The donor has caused his own likeness to be included in the icon. The likeness of the saint and the likeness of the donor meet on the plane of the icon, the donor in veneration of his beloved saint. Concerning the veneration of saints, John of Damascus wrote, the saints are the sons of God, sons of the kingdom, and co-heirs of God and of Christ. And in this case, we should say daughters of God and daughters of the kingdom and co-heirs of God and Christ. Therefore, I venerate the saints and glorify them, slaves and friends and co-heirs of Christ, slaves by nature, friends by choice, sons and daughters and heirs by divine grace. He also said, from the time that he who himself is life and the author of life was numbered among the dead, we do not call dead those who have fallen asleep in hope of the resurrection and faith in him. Sinai has an icon of the three children in the fire furnace of Babylon. It was executed in the encaustic technique that has been dated to about the seventh century. Enough of the inscription survived to identify the three from the viewer's left, Ananias, Azarias, and Misael. They are depicted wearing Persian garments. An angel has descended into the fiery furnace. He places his left hand comfortingly on the shoulder of Ananias, and with a cross-surmounted staff, he annuls the burning of the flames. The panel icon fits into a frame which has been inscribed with verses from the book of Daniel. 
an angel of the Lord came down into the furnace to be with Azariah and his companions and made the inside of the furnace as if a moist breeze were whistling through. The three children in the fire furnace inspired the early Christians. They were no less an inspiration to the monks of Sinai in the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries, examples of courage and steadfastness and reminders of God's protection. In the isolation of the Sinai desert, icons continue to be painted even during the 8th and 9th centuries, the time of iconoclasm. These icons form a link to earlier iconography that can be traced back in time to the Roman catacombs, where Christians express their faith instinctively in both inscriptions and images. St. John of Damascus justified the place of icons in Christian worship and veneration. In his writings, we also find the same consciousness of an immortality that was so pronounced in the epitaphs from the Roman catacombs. It is not only the imagery that has continued from those early centuries, but the faith and hope as well that place the images and epitaphs in the Roman catacombs long ago. Thank you. Father Justin came to us by way of Texas and Sinai. Our second speaker, Professor Stephen Fine of Yeshiva University, comes to us from California and Manhattan. He is an expert on Jewish art and history and has present, uh, done an award-winning book that's on sale in the exhibition gift shop, Art and Judaism in the Greco-Roman World. We very much appreciated that he expanded the definition of Greco-Roman through to the ninth century in his essay for our catalog. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fine. Um, when Helen Evan calls up and says, we're doing an exhibition about material that you know something about, but we know that you don't know so much about the part afterwards. Do you think you can try it anyway? That's one of those challenges that um, many of us uh, can't uh, miss. And so I'm really very grateful. The reason that we can't miss it is because for all of our fields, this period um, between the 7th and 9th and 10th centuries is what in Jewish studies at least is called the great black hole. That transition point between things that we think we know, those of us who do late antiquity, which are in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and some Latin, and that other side where they do Arabic, which we don't know. On the other hand, the folks who do Arabic on the other side don't know the things that we know. And so we're left with a period where because everything is in transition, where we go from people writing on scrolls to writing in codices, from writing in a homiletical format to writing philological studies, from writing the Bible in a way that doesn't have punctuation in Hebrew to writing it in a way that does have punctuation in Hebrew. We've come from such a long distance that Jewish history becomes a kind of canary in the coal mine, because after all, the Jews were the smallest of all the nations, not exactly the ones who were causing this transformation as opposed to Byzantium or Islam, but were in between and participating in this transformation. Now, if the Jews were ma'at mecholamim, the smallest of all the nations, then even smaller than the Jews were the other Israelites, the descendants of the 10 lost tribes of Israel, the Samaritans, of which there are about 750 today. And so what I'd like to do with you in the next little while is go through and talk about just two of the artifacts in our exhibition and use them as exemplars of two different things. Number one, we're going to look at this mess on the right of the screen, this palimpsest, this rewritten piece of manuscript to talk about 
all the different culturally sophisticated and interesting and messy things that went on in the period between the glories of, of late antiquity and the rise of Islam. And number two, we're going to look at a plate which might be Samaritan, it might not be Samaritan, but no one ever asked if it were Samaritan until we began to ask these questions about transition times and the liminality, the force of being neither in the world of Byzantium nor in the world of Islam that might lead to us interpreting the material differently. And so there are two issues. One is the physicality of the transformation, which is visceral in this small piece of parchment, which really is rather small. You can see it upstairs. And the conceptualization, the new way of thinking scholars have developed because of the kind of research that this exhibition has, has caused and that a whole change has developed within the scholarly community over the last decade. This exhibition wanted, being one of those great catalysts for that change that we'll be reading about for generations to come. Now, number one, a polymcist culture in an age of transition. Now, a polymcist is a piece of parchment that someone had written on, somebody else came and scrubbed off what was underneath and written something else. The only reason you would do that is because the parchment is very expensive because it's made out of animal skin and it's not simple. This particular one you can see has, was found in the Cairo Geniza in Egypt. Now, a, the Cairo Geniza, the great repository of the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Cairo, was a place where Jews in this city, in this central Fatimid place, threw anything they had that vaguely looked like a holy book into the attic. Why did they do that? Because holy books in Judaism are to be preserved and buried and maintained and not burnt as they are in other traditions. So in this attic in Cairo, the Jewish community over a 500 year period through all sorts of stuff. Now, I can tell you that at Yeshivaki University, all sorts of things end up in this hidden place, in these boxes that shouldn't, because I'm the one who puts them there. And so whether it be my Xeroxes, or whether it be the receipt that falls between the Xeroxes, or whether it be the piece of paper that I didn't mean to be between the Xeroxes of all of these holy texts, it all gets thrown into a box and goes to the cemetery and gets buried, okay? The same thing happened in Cairo. All of these wonderful things, whether they be love letters or whether they be magical texts or whether they be biblical texts that weren't hardly known before in Hebrew, like the book of Ecclesiasticus, Ben Sira, or whether they be trade documents or whether they be Talmudic texts or whether they be medieval um, letters or even texts written in Yiddish, found their way into this collection of documents that began to dribble out in Cairo at the end of the 19th century and which Solomon Schechter, the great scholar of Cambridge, came and bought in mass and brought back to Cambridge. Now, this was a mess. I, I would love to have been in this room, right? Because each piece that you see there is valuable whether it be a love letter, whether it be a, ma a magical incantation, whether it be a new commentary by Maimonides, all those things are sitting in those piles waiting for someone to read them, okay? Now, this thing is one of those documents, and it was noticed really early because of the Greek that you can see underneath. Now, what is it? Well, it's a sixth century or so manuscript written in Greek in very large and profound letters, which somebody purchased in Cairo in the 11th century, it's a long time later, and scratched, with all of the writing scratched off, and wrote something else on. Now, again, that was not male intent. It was just reuse of resources. Who used Greek in Cairo in the 11th century other than Christians? They were not the majority interest for Jews and Muslims at that point. Greek was a declining language even among Christians and part of the Near East. And so here we had a Greek document that somebody scratched off, but there's a real problem with the iron-based gallnut ink that was used in these inscriptions. You can scratch it all you want, but eventually it's gonna oxidize and pop back again, right? That's why one of the Talmudic rabbis once said that it's better to be, to learn when you are young, when you are like new paper, as opposed to when you are old, when you are like 
reused paper because the older information from your childhood is going to come back up to the surface. So it's a wonderful metaphor of a palimpsest. Now, this is the kind of scroll that Jews used in the ancient world. That's the great Isaiah scroll on the right, that grimy looking thing on the, on, excuse me, on the left. That grimy looking thing on the right is a um, piece of the Song of Songs, beginning of Exodus. Let me see if this works. There it is. That happens to now be at uh, Duke University from the seventh century. It's the oldest Jewish biblical text in Hebrew between the Dead Sea Scrolls in the first centuries and the Cairo Geniza documents. Jews wrote on scrolls, down to writing Talmudic text on scrolls uh, in the years before the coming of Islam. But a scroll, it may be holy, it may be the one that came from Mount Sinai, it may be the ultimate Jewish icon, but it is not a very convenient book. A, a codex is far more convenient. And Jews, rather early, starting in the 8th century with the first Gaster Bible on the right, which you can go see upstairs, written in Palestine, um, it's a very nice document, or the great Aleppo Codex um, on your left, which uh, was finished in the, in the 10th century, and by the way, Maimonides is considered to be the standard for all Torah, uh, Torah texts, biblical texts, two-thirds of which is now in Jerusalem, one-third of which was burnt. Um, you can see Jews taking on a new technology, taking on a codex form, which was, pos which was common to Christians, common to Muslims, not common to Jews, by writing on the entire page, oops, go back, the folks of the Gaster Bible were very much in the tradition of Quran script and the construction of the, uh, or the organization of the page. In the three columns, Jews were very much similar to what Christians were doing in their manuscript uh, organization. But Jews started writing like this, except for Torah scrolls that were used in synagogues um, on the Sabbath and holidays. Um, and so our fragment comes from this tradition, and you can see it up close. It is a true mess. Underneath are texts from 2 Kings 23, 11 to 27. And that's what immediately caught everyone's attention. So in 1897, soon after Schechter returned with these materials from Cairo to Cambridge, Charles Burkett, a biblical scholar, looked underneath these manuscripts, started to read the undertext, followed by a fellow named Charles Taylor around 1900, and started publishing them, and realized that they had before them were biblical text in Greek that we know about from Origen's great Hexapla, Origen of Caesarea in Palestine, who collected biblical text, and what we had was a text by a fellow named Aquilus. Now, Aquilus was a convert to Judaism in the second century who associated himself with the great, one of the great founding fathers of the religion of the rabbis, a fellow named Akiva, son of Joseph. Now, Rabbi Akiva had a principle in biblical interpretation, which was that every letter matters in the Hebrew text. You know how when you translate things from any language, there's always going to be some form that doesn't transfer well? Otherwise, it feels like a clunky translation. Well, Akiba's translation, the translation that he wanted into Greek, must present every jot and tittle of the original Hebrew because every jot and tittle matters. And that's what Aquiles created. Now, we find it here for the first time, sort of. Now, this is a Christian manuscript of about the same time. This is the uh, Sinai manuscript of the, New Test of the Bible, which is uh, from the fourth century, which unfortunately is no longer at Mount Sinai, um, but spread through four museums and libraries uh, in the West, just to give you a sense of what was underneath. Now, Jews used Greek quite a bit in the ancient world, going back to the first centuries. But in the seventh century, in a synagogue at Ashkelon, we see a very good example of how Greek and Aramaic lived side by side in this synagogue at Ashkelon, um, Jews using both languages, sometimes and often using the translation of Aquilus. And this is an even better one. This is a stone in a baptismal pool 
in a place that used to be called Nicaea and is now called Iznik in Turkey, in northern Turkey. Now, this stone was reused in the 8th century as part of the city walls. That's what the inscription above is about. But you can see how later on the stone was taken and the stone with this nice menorah was set into the side of a baptismal pool. And this is what it looks like vertically. Now, in 1943 in Berlin, this inscription down below was published, which I'll come back to in a minute. But, and the guy in Berlin with a book that had a swastika on the cover um, didn't mention much about this thing up here. Now, I don't think it's because he was writing in Nazi Germany. I think it's because epigraphers often don't see the things that their objects, their text, are next to. And that's pretty common to this day, that you'll find books that will tell you everything to know about this, but nothing about this, which is probably the nicest menorah ever found in Turkey, um, but that's a different story. Now, down below is a Greek text which translates from Psalm 136, he who gives bread to all living things for his abundant love endures forever, which is a quote in the translation of Aquilus. So we know that the Jews in Asia Minor in the 6th century were using this translation that we found on the back of our palm cyst. Let's go one step further. This is a piece found at Nahal Hefer, which is um, one of the canyons near the Dead Sea, um, where documents were found from the 2nd century from the Jewish revolt against Rome of 132 to 135 of the prophet Habakkuk. And you notice the name of God, oops, the name of God here is written in an ancient Hebrew script. It's hard to see, I know. Especially since whoever copied it probably didn't know that ancient Hebrew script. But in fact, Aquilus, in his text, as preserved by this Geniza document, also writes God's name in an ancient Hebrew script, a way of, of presenting the antiquity of the holiness of the Tetragrammaton, which, which um, Protestants often pronounce Jehovah as a sanctified object and um, within the manuscript. And so this is another one of those ties between um, ancient Jewish text and our polym cyst. And by the way, this script is still used by the Samaritans to this day, and we'll come back to that. Let's go back to our mess. On top of the Greek was written all that beautiful Hebrew, right? Which is very shiny and very nice and easy to see. And no one paid any attention to it because there's so much Hebrew found in the Cairo Geniza. Now, imagine what happened. Solomon Schechter looked at it and said, oh, it looks liturgical. Great. That's sort of like saying it's a cult object when you deal with archaeology, right? Um, it looks liturgical. In the Cairo Geniza, that's not too hard. Number two, they published an image of this in the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1901 in front of God and anybody and anybody who wanted to read it without being in a technical journal. But no one bothered to read the Hebrew because we were interested in the text of Aquilas underneath. It wasn't until the period right after World War I when a scholar at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York named Israel Davidson sat down and started reading the letters of the Hebrew. And he realized that what was before him was a poem by a guy named Yanai, spelled Yud Nun, Yud Yud. How do we know that's how it's spelled? Because he signed his name down the side of the poems which is similar to what Byzantine authors were doing at the same time. He lived in the 5th century, 5th, 6th century in Palestine, and he was a synagogue liturgical poet. And folks knew about him because, after all, the 10th, the 10th 11th century scholars had written about him as an ancient author of liturgical poetry. And one of his poems was preserved in the Passover Haggadah a poem called, It Happened at Evening, by Hiba Chatzi Alayla. And so one of his poems was preserved. Thanks to the Cairo Geniza, we now have, oh, more than 264 of them. Well published, among the most important Hebrew liturgical poetry ever discovered, now in two, two editions, and a third book recently published by Laura Lieber of Duke University that um, translates just his commentary on Genesis 
which takes about 700 pages. Just to give you a sense, okay? Let me give you a sense. Let me go on with it. Okay. It's an ancient synagogue in the Galilee just for atmospherics. Let me give you a sense of one of his poems. The nation called Jews, Yehudim, because they thank the name of God, Yamudim. In truth, they are called one because they constantly unify the one. Rejoice in fear and trembling. Serve him with awe and quivering. Come forth with praise and thanks. Call out to Torah and to testimony. The multitudes will not say holy above, meaning the multitudes in heaven, until the believers say blessed below on earth. And when they stand and whisper in their mouths below, standing, the angels will slacken their wings above and recite, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And that's just one little paragraph out of poems of at least four or five pages each, 260 something of them. Now, that's one of the ways that an object can give you a sense of the transitional nature of community, how the text went from being a Jewish translation of the second century to a text preserved by Jews and Christians into the third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries to be a piece of manuscript that no one needs anymore and hence is scraped off to be reused for a completely different period, pur purpose in the 11th century, which was to preserve Jewish traditions of the sixth century. Is that cool? Now, let's try another one. Let's take a look at this plate, which you can also see upstairs. It's from the Louvre. We used it in the Sacred Realm, the emergence of the synagogue in the ancient world in 1996 at YU Museum. Um, it's a very nice plate. Um, the importance of having it here is, is for me, astonishing, because in these photographs, you can never see how thick these things are, and, and you can't get your nose into them and really understand these objects until they're together, which for all of us who are involved in the exhibition, and I hope for you who are coming to it, that's an important factor, putting your nose up to it and seeing what it is before the guards stop you. Um, now, let's take a look. If you look close up on this plate, you can see a very nice menorah right here. You see it? Right? Little bulbs, crossed it, a piece going across the top to hold it together, some little flames. Over here it's more rubbed, but you can see another object, which is a Torah ark, right? which I'll come back to in a minute. Oop, there it is. That's my drawing. Don't take it seriously. Um, here you see the ark. You can see a little conch shell up above inside the arch. Right? There it is down there in my decrepit drawing. Here you see the panels of the doors, right? And there are some um, olive branches on either side. You see those, right? Okay, that comes through a little bit better. And when you see the object, you'll have to squint to see all of this. Now, this object was found at a place called Anana, or next to what's now Kibbutz Na'an, um, south of Lod in the, Shre in the Judean Shvela, um, while a train was being built between Jerusalem and Jaffa in the late 19th century, and a British explorer and archaeologist named Charles Clermont Ganot was looking around looking for Jewish and Christian and, and all sorts of antiquities, which he eventually brought back to the Louvre, along with the plate that you just saw. And he found that plate along with this very nice column up above. And the column says on it, Es Teos, one God. Now, Es Teos, one God, hardly ever shows up on Jewish inscriptions. Um, no, and has never yet, of the hundreds of synagogues found in Israel, and the pieces of synagogues found in Israel, shown up on a Jewish object, except maybe this one. It's pretty common in church context, but pictures of Torah arcs and menorahs are less common there. Now, Clermont Gonneau knew that just a few years before, this piece had been discovered at a place called Emmaus, which is famous from the New Testament, um, which is on the road to Jerusalem heading into the Judean Hill Country. And this stone from Emmaus is written in Samaritan script, the same stuff that the God, name of God was written on in our palimpsest, in Samaritan script, here. And it says... Baruch Shemo Olam, may his name be blessed eternally. And on the back in Hebrew, 
and on the back, one God, es teos. And he said, gee, maybe this stone up above from Naan and this stone down below can help explain each other. Maybe if this one's Samaritan and it says one God, maybe this stone is Samaritan and it says one God, that means maybe the plate is Samaritan. And then everybody more or less forgot what he said because no one really thought much about Samaritan anything at the end of the 19th century. And both of these objects, minus the uh, stone from Amaios, were assumed to be Jewish. Now, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, here you see the area of Kibbutz Na, of Na'an, of Na'ana. Here you see the area of Amaios, right? But just to give some context, over here is Jaffa, over here is Jerusalem. So we're in, in this region right here, near the D in Judea, okay? Now, not surprisingly, in 1949, Elazar Liposukhanik, the Israeli archaeologist, found another Samaritan synagogue in this area, here at a place called Shalavim, which is lovely stone, mosaic, with a picture of the Samaritan holy mountain. They don't face toward Jerusalem. They found, face toward Mount Grizim, which is in Nablus here. There it says Mount Grizim, Neapolis, otherwise known as Nablus, uh, with nice Samaritan script on it. Um, and what does it say? God will rule forever and ever. Hashem yim locha olam va'ed. Great. So more Samaritan evidence never put together. Now, if you don't know, these are the Samaritans. On the right is a high priest of the Samaritans, claims to be a descendant of Aaron the high priest. The Samaritans claim to be descendants of the ten lost tribes. There's no reason to think that they're not descendants of ancient people from this region of the, of the, of the, of the Israelite background. Here you see a Torah scroll of the Samaritans written in Samaritan, meaning Paleo-Hebrew script. This is the Abisha scroll, which they believe was written soon after the exodus from Egypt, which we know was an 11th century manuscript, but don't tell them I said so. Um, over here, you can see a Samaritan synagogue in, uh, near Tel Aviv in Cholon. Um, you can see the menorah on the front of the synagogue. So again, menorahs and Samaritans are a pretty common thing. Up above, Baruch uh, Baruch Blessed are you coming when you're coming, and blessed are you when you're going. Another quote from Deuteronomy. And down below, to prove that I'm really not colonialist, here you see a Samaritan scribe, ritual slaughterer, and artist in his home. He made these lovely pictures. Which, are, which contain Samaritan script, and they call them the Zuzot. They put them on the, on the doorpost of their homes and inside their homes um, in the same way that Jews put little pieces of parchment on their doors. And the, the book in the front, which is a Bible book, a, a book of the Pentateuch, he copied it. Now, going back to the Samaritans, here you see our object with its very nice, once again, conch up above, and it's one, two panels, three, four, and his little feet right down here, right? Okay, great. It's a good reason people would say that these were Jewish. After all, it looks just like this one from a synagogue near Tiberias where you see similar panels and a similar conch. Gee, if that's Jewish, why shouldn't that be Jewish, right? Or these, the synagogue at Dororopos in Syria with its conch from the third century, or the, the uh, Roman glass, which happens to be in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art with its Torah ark, or this Torah ark found in the Upper Galilee, complete with conch and place for suspending lamp down here, what today they call a ner tamid, an eternal light. Why shouldn't anybody think it was Jewish? Except that these things started coming out of the ground in the 1980s. This floor from uh, Herbert Samara in the, in the West Bank from a Samaritan synagogue where you see exactly the same imagery that we saw in, on our plate. And so now we have it that Jews and Samaritans are using exactly the same imagery. And that makes it even harder for people like me to figure out who and what belongs to whom and where. Or this really great one, which is from a place called er El Cherba, also in Samaria, in the West Bank, um, with this lovely Torah ark with its conch, this table in the middle set for dinner, 
Notice the little dots on the table. We'll come back to those. This menorah right here with an incense shovel and a horn, a shofar. Right? Very nice thing. Um, there are people who want to say that this table in the middle is the table of the showbread and the temple, except I don't think they had dinner in their temple, so I don't know what that table does in a Samaritan context. Now, notice again our object in comparison to the Samaritan object from the floor, the mosaic piece this depiction. They are really very close, down to the little conch up here and the little conch up here. Now, this floor was found in the 1960s in Bet Sha'an, Scythopolis, um, just north of the city. And it's a very nice floor, and I use it for all sorts of purposes because of its delicious colors. But notice once again our gable here, our conch here. Um, but what's most interesting to me is that here you have what looks like an olive twig and another olive twig. And down here you have a shofar. And over here, you have to believe me, is a incense shovel. But what's missing that you'd expect there to be is the, the paramount Jewish symbol of the festival of Sukkot that appears on almost every object representing the biblical festival of tabernacles, the lulav. Here you see a palm frond complete with willows, complete with myrtles, complete with an A. Where's my light? Is he on? Is he on? Did I lose him? Oh, he had fingers in front of him. Yeah. Complete with a citron. Standard Jewish stuff that the Samaritan object simply doesn't have. Samaritan floors, as you see down below, may have a incense shovel and may have a shofar, but it is not going to have this because Samaritans do not use this for the festival of tabernacles. It is a Jewish invention. It's an old Jewish invention. In fact, Simon Bar Kosiba, in the midst of the war, wrote a letter to his, to his officers and said, make sure that you provide palm fronds and citrons and willows and, um, and, and then what's the other one? And uh, hadassim and um, myrtles to your armies because we need them. The camp requires them for the festival. Jews had used this for a very long time, but Samaritans never did. And so Ruth Jacoby of the Hebrew University realized in looking at all of these images that one of the ways to identify a Samaritan object was by no, it's not having a lulav. Now that's a very subtle difference, but it is a difference between these communities. Now, none of us had paid much attention to that fact, and so it's a good bet. There's, again, our table and our plate, that this plate was used in a Samaritan context. I can go you one step better. You see this plate has these nice little flowers decorating it? Look at my nice little flowers here. Now, I'm not making too much of this. I'm just suggesting that it's a very similar plate illustrated on this mosaic to the one that was discovered at Naan. The point being that through careful detective work, it is possible to take apart the pieces to figure out the complex identity issues that appear in the literature and in the art of this period to imagine a world which is in transition, to imagine a world where a document like that could exist with all of the complexities involved, or that a plight like this could be misinterpreted for about 100 years because we didn't have eyes to see differently. And so thank you very much, and I hope you'll enjoy the exhibition. What I thought was very interesting about this um, series of talks and not totally expected 
was the degree in which the speakers encouraged the idea of coexistence. So before we start this, I would like to thank the Coexist Foundation, which I hope is pleased with its funding of today. What I'd like to ask each of you is, do you think that the, the idea of your talks and the exhibition really do encourage us to think of these communities living together and interacting more than being um, a structure in which one imposes itself on the other? <laughs> You're looking at me, aren't Well, there are lots of here. Yeah. And we have lots of these things. It, it, it's hard, when I was putting together the talk, one of the things I had most difficulty with was title, um, because I didn't want to talk about influence and I didn't want to talk about different communities. I don't think you're on. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I did want to speak about influence, I didn't want to speak about different communities, because that prejudges the issue, that, that assumes that they're separate and that they need to, to cross lines that we've imagined. And I think it's an interesting way to look at the material without starting with the assumption that there are such lines that need to be crossed. And um, late in the process of this, um, Fred Donner uh, from the University of Chicago published a, a book called Muhammad and the Believers, um, which takes a very similar point of view, that it's, it's not so clear that at least in the seventh century that these confessional um, divisions were already firmly established. Stephen? Um, I always tell my students that, uh, can you hear me now? Perfect. I always tell my students that uh, I start with the premise that Jews are more or less the same as everyone else until they're not, um, which gives me the sense of, of the shared culture for a minority community, which, which is obviously different than for the Byzantine community, Byzantine Christian community, or for the Muslim community, because I'm dealing with this little tiny group. And so sometimes they're persecuted, sometimes they're not persecuted, but they were really happy when Islam came along and made them into subservient people as opposed to hated people. That was a major moment. It was better to be subservient and not be able to ride a horse than it was, in their minds, to live under Christian Byzantium, which they've had all sorts of difficulties with. Now, when we talk about Christian Byzantium, we're actually talking about a variety of Christian communities, not all of whom are liked by the the state, so Father Justin's Monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai is part of the official church from Constantinople. Would you see that tremendously different than the Coptic or the Syriac or the Church of the East, these other communities who are also, like Stephen's um, community, not legal under the empire in the fullest form? Sinai was a part of the Holy Land, and that's why it remained ecclesiastically a part of Jerusalem and a part of Constantinople when many Christians in Egypt left that center. Uh, Sinai had existed for centuries before the coming of Islam and it's extraordinary that you have a center that has retained its link to the world of late antiquity, the Greek-speaking world, has, which has continued to this very day, but at the same time has managed to live in peaceful relations and harmonious relations with the new Islamic rulers. I, I think one of the things we're trying to do in the exhibition, and I think it does come through in these talks, is there's not just one community of any one thing, that even within the small community of Judaism, we have inscriptions upstairs in Aramaic, in Greek, in Hebrew. Um, we would have, if the mosa floor mosaics from Haman Leaf mosaic inscription survived, it would be in Latin. So obviously that limited small community has diversity. Certainly the elite of the empire in 600 are appointed to their offices from the capital and need to be orthodox to be appointed, but then they are surrounded by very learned communities that are arguing. I think one can never underestimate or fail to repeat often enough that these religious debates that are happening in the area from Syria through Egypt to North Africa are among people that would be the equivalent of Cambridge and Oxford and 
NYU today. They're not people who are making up their own religions because they don't know connections. It's because they are so very sophisticated in their arguments about the nature of the holy, and the holy is always so difficult to describe. Is that a fair statement? Well, one of the things when I, can I, oh, oh, that's better. Okay. Uh, when I started looking at this material, I, I, I was I'm supposed to teach a course on the arts of the Islamic world, which suggested one. Um, and, and there are just many. When, when you read the documents from the 7th century, there's very little about the Christians or the Jews. Uh, there's a great deal about the rivalry between different clans. Um, sh should the tradition follow, should, should the caliph be chosen from the family of the Prophet Muhammad or, or chosen by the elders of the community? Should, um, uh, you know, how should we run the taxes? Um, what's, what's the point of prayer? Um, what actually is the, um, the shahada, the, the confession of faith? Does it mention Muhammad as, as the prophet or not? And that the, the notion of a kind of monolithic Christian, I mean, we, we've known better, I think, about that for a long time because of the language and other distinctions in, in the East, but it's true also, I think, in the Jewish uh, material that there are rival groups and sects and they're just arguing among themselves all the time, and that's true in Islam. It, what we're really saying is that our idea that you have these units and that they all agree with each other and in some way have a, a nice wall um, around them, increasingly as we study it, just cannot be supported. And I think Larry made the point, even if the work is made for one community, it's perhaps made by people from another religious community. Um, there is much less solidity than the easiest description offers. And so now, in this generation of scholarship, we are trying to understand how communities argued, did not argue, worked together, did not work together. Is it true that in Muslim community, in, in areas where Muslims had taken the town, you have no large mosque, did they use synagogues and churches for worship? in the first generation before they were ready to build a Friday mosque. A Friday mosque is where all the Muslim community comes together to both pray and to hear what is happening. And, and in the first generation, you may have had relatively few people there compared to the larger population of the area. Syria is supposed to have been predominantly Christian into the 13th century. Um, and yet the great center of the Umayyads, the first important and ruling dynasty of the Islamic world is in Damascus. It doesn't mean everybody in greater Syria became Muslim as the Umayyads were there. And Sinai is to me a particularly important place because it's one of the first religious sites with great sanctity for over many centuries that the armies of the prophet would reach. I don't know of ones particularly south of there, but. Do you, Father Justin? We know that the um, area came under the jurisdiction of Islam in the year 633, so quite early. And it is that shared veneration for Sinai that has ensured the peaceful coexistence there for so many centuries of Christians and Muslims. I hope all of you have a chance when you can go there. I, it, I'm being waved at. If you will stay, Alan Gampal, who has been sitting very nicely at the end, is doing research in terms of music that extends what we've been talking about today because he's looking in early, in early hymns and early text of a number of religious communities for signs of how and when musical notation develops, and that has grown out of his own career as an eminent um, classical pianist and someone who since he was a at 16 at the White House performing has been interested both in the beauty of the music and in the logic behind it. So if you'll give us a minute to get the piano set up, we're going to hear from him. Music, in the form of liturgical chant, was an integral part of all three monotheistic religions in the early Byzantine period from the third to the seventh centuries. All three religions insisted that their scripture be sung and not just read aloud. 
as can be seen in these quotes from the New Testament, the Talmud, and the Islamic Quran. During this formative period, the liturgical and musical relationships between early Christianity and Judaism were quite strong. Many early Christians were recent Jewish converts, and they were comfortable with Jewish liturgical music in spite of their changed theological faiths. The Old Testament Psalms were the centerpiece of the liturgy of the early church. And for several centuries, Jewish cantors were hired by certain Christian communities to teach the cantillation of the Old Testament and the singing of the Psalms. In the fifth century, <clears throat> the Christian bishop of Menorca wrote about a procession of Christians and Jews. Quote, we began to sing the ninth Psalm, and the throngs of Jews also began to sing it with a wondrous sweetness, end quote. Obviously, if the two groups were singing simultaneously, the melodies must have been somewhat similar. Some earlier followers of the Islamic faith also shared musical liturgical elements with Christians and Jews. One of the many hadiths attributed, quotes, attributed to Muhammad reads, quote, recite the Quran in the tunes and songs of the Arabs and beware the tunes of the people of the two books. End quote. The two books obviously references to the Jewish Old Testament and the Christian New Testament. And this quote affirms, on the one hand, that the Quran was musically chanted and not just read. It also suggests that some Islamic communities had adopted Jewish and Christian chant styles. Textual references like these help to understand the musical liturgical culture in the early Byzantine period. However, only musical notation may shed light on the music itself. What do we know about notation 2,000 years ago in this region? The ancient Greeks had invented a very complex system of musical notation around 400 BC that used Greek letters, sometimes inverted, turned around, chopped in half, to represent notes or pitches. Of the 75 examples of this ancient notation that still exists today, all are pagan except for a single Christian hymn. Here is an image of the papyrus of this hymn above, uh, the hymn to the Trinity found in Oxyrhynchus, with a transcription of the ancient notation below on the left, if, if this pointer does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to do. In any case, oh, there, well, I don't know. Hmm. Try this one, should I point? There we go. So here we see the musical symbols above the Greek text. And on the right side, a transcription into modern musical notation with the same text and the modern musical notes above. Let's uh, listen to a short excerpt of this hymn sung by the ensemble Kerylos. This ancient notation fell out of use in the fourth century after this hymn was written. Perhaps the close association with paganism offended the Christian uh, clergy. The musical explanation for the disappearance of ancient Greek musical notation is that Christian chant was improvisational, unlike Greek and Roman, Roman pagan music. Some words were sung with modal, melismatic motives that would have been difficult to notate using the ancient Greek system. A similar thing happened recently in the 20th century, when jazz musicians invented a new notation system because standard notation didn't work for their improvisational music. A completely different type of notation also existed during this ancient period. Every word in the spoken Greek language had a pitch accent, which meant that the voice went up or down a specific amount on a specific syllable. If the musical inflection was incorrect, pronounced incorrectly, the meaning of the word might change. This musical element of Greek was called prosody, from the Greek words pros, meaning for, and ode, meaning song, for song. Greek became the standard administrative language throughout the Eastern Mediterranean basin when Alexander the Great conquered the region around 330 BC. 
people who spoke local languages such as Aramaic or Syriac weren't accustomed to these pitch accents. Aristophanes of Byzantium in about 180 BC who worked in the great library of Alexandria in Egypt formalized a system of written prosodic accents in an attempt to save the old pitch pronunciation for Greek-speaking Egyptians. However, the oral prosody in Greek gradually disappeared and was replaced by the more common syllabic stress accents. Prior to the ninth century, there are very few traces of Aristophanes' accents, although they became used standard as standard accents from the ninth century onward. Here are four examples of their use prior to the ninth century. In a small passage on a papyrus of Romans from the New Testament from the fourth century, we can see a circumflex accent over the letter eta. Um, here, from the Dakla Oasis in Egypt, a teacher's de Pinto, uh, an inscription on a classroom wall, we can see many of these accents, uh, acute, grave, and uh, circumflex. And here, on part of Homer's Iliad from the sixth century, uh, we can also see a variety of, of accents, accents. Finally, a sixth century papyrus with verses from the book of Matthew. Again, all three of the accents can be found here. All four of these examples follow the rules of accentuation in the choice and placement of the accents, the rules established by Aristophanes for where to place them and which accents were to be used. Let's listen to Christos Halkias chant or cantillate the first verse of Matthew on this papyrus. Και με θυμέρας έξ παραλαμβάνει ο Ιησούς τον Πέτρον και Ιάκωβον και Ιωάννην τον αδελφόν αυτού και αναφέρει αυτούς εις όρος υψηλών κατηδίων και μετεμορφώθη έμπροσθεν αυτών και έλαμψεν το πρόσωπον αυτού ως ο ήλιος τα δε ημάτι αυτού εγένε το λευκά ως το φως. Many Greek manuscripts of Christian hymns, Christian hymns also contain accents. However, for the hymn texts, which were not cantillated but sung, the accents don't follow the accent rules. Here is a fifth century papyrus of a hymn to, to Mary with three accent marks, and they're all in the wrong places. <laughs> you can see up here, here, and here the word doxolucusin, the accent, the circumflex is here. It should be over the upsilon uh, earlier in the word. Here is a 6th century ostracon that's actually here at the Met of a Christian hymn with 13 accents, again, all in the wrong places. Why did the scribe choose the wrong accents and put them in the wrong places? Hymns were an important part of the early Christian liturgy, and some Byzantine hymnographers, instead of composing their own melodies, wrote texts to be sung to standard, well-known tunes. The accent marks in these hymns didn't represent specific notes or intervals. They indicated musical changes to a well-known melody to accommodate a different text, for example, to highlight an important word, an atomalisma. Over the next few centuries, this new musical use of accents in hymn texts increased and other signs were added as well. Here, for example, is an eighth century papyrus with a hymn by Cosmas of Mayuma, one of the great Byzantine hymnographers of the eighth century. It's still sung today in the Byzantine rite. In this papyrus, we see a far more developed system of accents. Let's listen to Christos Halkias sing an excerpt of this hymn and notice the difference between his biblical cantillation from a few moments ago and this melodic singing of a hymn. <laughs> Υπαγγέλων δόξης δορυφορούμενων Ο τάλασσε εγώ προγα 
The Byzantine accents for chanting Greek biblical texts served as the basis for a system of neumes for singing Greek liturgical hymns, and both systems were used simultaneously for several centuries. This chart, oh, sorry, that was supposed to be up during the singing. <laughs> this chart by the musicologist David Hiley shows the close relationship between the prosodic accents on the left, the Byzantine ekphonetic accents in the middle, and the neumes that were used for hymn singing uh, on the right. A system for, of signs for the Hebrew cantillation of the Old Testament called Ta'amim appeared about the same time as this complete Byzantine system. Some scholars claim that the Ta'amim also evolved from Aristophanes' prosodic accents. Here is the oldest extant example of the Ta'amim from the 9th century Cairo Codex. We don't know what these signs originally represented, but over the past millennium, the musical motives associated with each Ta'am ta have been transformed to correspond with local traditional music. For example, the same Ta'am sign might represent one musical motive in Kiev, a different one in Madrid, and a third in Prague. You can see this, this passage has been taken from this lower middle, middle column. The earliest Western manuscripts with musical signs also appeared in the ninth century. These signs in Latin liturgical texts are called neums, either from the Greek word neum, which means sign or direction, or the Hebrew word nema, which means tune. Here is an example of the earliest written neums, also ninth century, in a manuscript, manuscript from Sangal. French monks in the 19th century demonstrated the evolution of these signs by comparing manuscripts of identical texts with slightly changed musical signs over the course of several centuries, they were able to show how these neumes developed into modern standard musical notation that we use today. Here is a Hebrew manuscript from the 11th century that illustrates an intermediary stage in the evolution of Latin neumes. Many of the notes are distinct, as in today's notation, and they are written around three horizontal lines that you may be able to see more clearly here. These horizontal lines show the relative pitch of the notes. This Hebrew version of a portion of the Old Testament with Latin notation provides yet another illustration of the frequent exchange between Christianity and Judaism in the musical liturgical domain. As a final demonstration of the ongoing relationship between the liturgical music of the three religions, let us move to three modern examples of Christian, Jewish, and Islamic-based music. First, a short cello and piano piece that evokes Byzantine psalm chanting, psalmodia, then, a cello and piano rendition of the Jewish prayer Kaddish by Ravel, who was French, Basque, half Jewish, and half Catholic. <laughs> and last, Islamay, a solo piece by Mili Barakirev, who was an Orthodox Russian composer, very nationalistic, born in Nizhny Novgorod, the capital of the Bulgar region, which has a very strong Muslim and had a very strong Muslim history and population.
Thank you.